Welcome to the Classical View of Probability, a video lesson of probability and statistics. We'll take our first look at the fundamentals of probability by exploring the oldest approach to the subject, the classical interpretation. The act of counting is fundamental to the classical interpretation. In order to count extremely large quantities efficiently, we'll need to develop techniques that exploit the structure of what we're counting. These techniques, called combinatorial techniques, will play a central role when we begin to develop our own probability models or probability distributions later on. So we'll begin with a definition. The classical interpretation of probability models a process that can result in a fixed number, n, of distinct outcomes. Each outcome is equally likely to occur. If a number r less than or equal to n of these outcomes are somehow preferred, then the probability of obtaining a preferred outcome is p equals r over n. So to recap, in this definition there's a few key components. We've got a fixed number of distinct outcomes. They're all equally likely. We've identified some of them that are preferred, and then the probability of a preferred outcome is the number of preferred outcomes divided by the total number of outcomes. We'll illustrate the classical interpretation of probability through an example. Imagine playing a dice game in which we roll an ordinary six-sided die, and we're interested in understanding how likely it is to roll a prime number. Prime numbers are just integers that are greater than or equal to two, that are also evenly divisible only by one in themselves. So to analyze this game, we would need to observe that only prime numbers between one and six are the numbers two, three, and five. In other words, there are r equals three ways we could roll the die and obtain a prime number. Now since there are n equals six possible numbers that could turn up after any given roll, we would compute the probability of obtaining a prime number on a single dice roll by dividing three by six. In other words, the probability of obtaining a prime number is three over six, or exactly 50%. Our dice game example involved an extremely low number of total possibilities and an even smaller number of preferred possibilities. Most of the time when we bother to analyze a scenario with the classical interpretation of probability, the complexity is much greater than that. And we'll see that it doesn't take much to cause that complexity to escalate. So in our next example, we imagine a couple who are about to start a family, and they, they just plan to have three children. Assuming that it's equally likely that any one child will turn out to be male or female, the couple wonders what, chance, what the chances are that they will produce three children, of which any two are girls. The most direct approach to analyzing this situation is to once again count, and we're going to do that by simply making a list of all the possible ways the couple could have three children and then count the ones that involve exactly two girls in order to determine the total number of possibilities and the number of preferred possibilities respectively. Our table that lists the total number of ways that this couple could have three children looks something like this. We see that the first row involves all males, the last row involves all females, and the remaining rows involve some males and some females. But only the fourth, the sixth, and the seventh row involve exactly two females. And so those rows represent the three preferred outcomes out of the eight total possible outcomes within this, this scenario. So the table shows us that the probability of having three children in which two are girls and one is a boy is just three over eight. Now this is still an example that involves a small number of total possibilities and an even smaller number of preferred possibilities. But what I'm hoping this example illustrates is that it's not going to take much to ramp up the complexity of similar examples to where making a table like the one that we've seen or just simply counting possibilities is going to be difficult. 
imagine, for instance, what would happen if the family wanted to have 10 children and we wanted to determine what the probability was of, of uh, having 10 children of which only maybe seven were girls. It becomes a much more challenging example in that case, as we'll see, to analyze it just with a table or just with counting. So we're going to have to develop some more sophisticated tools to do that counting for us efficiently. The first of our efficient techniques for counting the number of possibilities that could occur within a system is the multiplication rule. And like all of our efficient techniques for counting that we're going to study, the multiplication rule seeks to exploit structure. And the way it does that, the way the multiplication rule in particular does that, is that it calls upon us to look at our scenario as a sequence of decisions that we might be making. And so here's how it works. If we've got a sequence of decisions that we are making, and we understand that each of those decisions could result in their own number of outcomes, the multiplication rule tells us that that total sequence can be made in a number of ways it's equal to just the product of those individual counts of outcomes. So if our first decision can occur in, uh, can result in m sub 1 outcomes and the second decision can result in m sub 2 outcomes and we go all the way up to the last or the nth decision and we know that it can result in m sub n outcomes then the total number of ways that process, that sequence of decisions, can be made is m sub 1 times m sub 2 times m sub 3 all the way up through m sub n. And that's what the multiplication rule tells us. So let's illustrate the multiplication rule with an example. Recall the couple from the previous example who were planning to start a family. They decided that they would have three children and were curious about the probability that they would end up with two girls and one boy. This situation can be viewed as a sequence of decisions. The gender of each child can be thought of as a decision. If we imagine that this decision has two possible outcomes, then by the multiplication rule there's a total of n equals 2 times 2 times 2 ways that their children's gender may be arranged. Now the preferred outcome of having two girls and one boy boils down to just making one decision. Which of the three children will be a boy? There are r equals three ways this decision can be made. Therefore, and this is consistent with what we've already seen, the probability that the family ends up with two girls and one boy is p equals three divided by eight. This example is small enough that it allows us to gain some insight into why the multiplication rule works. We can diagram the decisions of this example in the form of a tree. Each level of the tree represents a decision and each branch represents the possible outcomes of that decision, or the gender of the child in this case. Whenever a decision has traversed at least one level of the tree, a copy of the branch structure for the outcomes of the next decision must be drawn from each of the outcomes of the previous decisions. This represents the fact that the process we are modeling is a sequence of decisions that must be made. In other words, regardless of the outcome we arrive at after one decision, we are still always faced with the next decision in the sequence. The total number of top to bottom pathways through the tree are equivalent to the total number of outcomes the process may result in. We can easily count the number of these pathways by counting the number of nodes at the lowest level of the tree. In our example, there are eight nodes at the bottom of the tree, which is equivalent to the prediction made by the multiplication rule. n equals 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8. Increasing the number of decisions in a process, or the numbers of outcomes associated with any of the individual decisions, even by a small amount, can dramatically increase the overall number of outcomes in the overall process. This increase is so dramatic that it would not be practical to count possibilities by constructing a table or a tree. So let's illustrate that by an example. A deli offers sandwiches to be designed by the customer. The customer can choose from 
10 breads, 18 main ingredients, 12 greens, 6 condiments, and 9 cheeses. The task of making a sandwich is a sequence of five decisions that involve 10, 18, 12, 6, and 9 individual outcomes, respectively. We can therefore argue, by the multiplication rule, that there are a total of n equals 10 times 18 times 12 times 6 times 9, or 116,640 different sandwiches a customer could conceivably make. This assumes that they are all allowed to choose only one of each type of ingredient. Now suppose three of the 10 types of bread are gluten-free, that four of the 18 main ingredients are vegetarian, and that one of the cheeses is actually not a cheese at all. It is a soy-based substitute. Then if we wanted to know the probability that a randomly generated sandwich will be gluten-free, vegetarian, and will have soy cheese, we would first need to compute the number of ways such a sandwich could be made. The multiplication rule tells us that there are r equals 3 times 4 times 12 times 6 times 1, or 864 ways such a sandwich could be made. Therefore, the probability of obtaining such a sandwich at random is just p equals 864 divided by 116,640. So in this example, we've used the multiplication rule to count both the total number of possibilities, 116,640 sandwiches, and the number of preferred possibilities, 864 uh, gluten-free vegetarian soy cheese sandwiches. Neither of these totals are small, so this example underscores the importance of having an efficient tool like the multiplication rule for counting large numbers of possibilities in these more complex decision-making systems. We'd never want to solve this problem by drawing a tree or constructing a table. Now, the strength of the multiplication rule lies in its generality. That said, we'll see that there are some special cases within these combinatorial systems, these counting systems, that come up frequently enough that we'll like to design a custom tool for counting possibilities when these special cases come up. The first special case of the multiplication rule occurs in situations where we have to assign some fixed number of things to the same number of roles. And so each decision is, which thing shall we assign to a given role? A mathematical operation known as a factorial can be helpful to us when we're computing the number of ways we can make that sequence of decisions. And so the factorial is just the operation of multiplying the first n integers together. It's common enough that we have a special notation for representing it. And you should be able to find a button or a menu item for calculating factorials on any scientific calculator. The formal definition of the factorial is that the factorial of a positive integer is defined to be the product of all positive integers up to and including that number. We symbolize the factorial of an integer n with the exclamation point sign. Therefore, n factorial is just 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 all the way up through n. We can illustrate how factorials are used in counting through the following example. So suppose we wanted to arrange eight books on a shelf left to right. Well, this is just a sequence of eight decisions. First we're going to choose which book occupies the first position and there's eight outcomes. Then next, we're going to choose which book is going to occupy the second position. There's only seven outcomes because we've already used one of our books. We've already put it on the shelf. After that, we choose a book to occupy the third position, and there's six outcomes for that. This process continues until there are no books left to put on the shelf. So the multiplication rule tells us that there are 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 or eight factorial ways to arrange the books. We might imagine 
situations where it becomes necessary to generalize the idea of what a factorial is capable of counting. Recall a factorial counts the number of ways we can take n things and assign them to that same number of roles n. What if we wanted to select some of the objects in a group and assign them to distinct roles? So we've got n things, but maybe only r roles to assign them to. A permutation counts the outcomes of this process, this kind of process. And so the formal definition of a permutation is that it's a selection of r objects from a collection of n things, a larger collection of n things, that is then assigned into a definite order or into distinct roles. Now, the notation for representing a permutation is p of n comma r. And the way you compute it starts off looking like a factorial. It's a product of n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3 and so on. So it's a product of a decreasing integer values. But this range doesn't go all the way down to 1. So there are only r numbers in that product. Now, that might look like a complicated formula. In some ways it is. But what we'll find is that on most scientific calculators, just like we have a factorial function, there's often also a permutation function. And so we'll see how to use that formally in the next, we'll see how to use permutations formally in the next example. But later on, we'll also see a tutorial for accessing the permutation function in um, a calculator and various types of mathematical software. So imagine we've got 20 baseball cards in a collection, but we wish to create an arrangement of only eight of them on a shelf in a left to right order of our own choosing. So we're not going to use all 20 of the cards in making this arrangement. We can still analyze this process in a way that uncovers the permutation formula. So our first decision is still which card to place in the first position. There's 20 outcomes corresponding to this decision because there's still 20 cards in our collection. Our second decision is which of the remaining 19 cards in our collection to place in the second position, so there's 19 outcomes. Third decision, then, is which of the remaining 18 cards in the collection do we place in the third position, so there's 18 outcomes. This pattern continues until we run out of positions in which we can place a card. Since there were originally eight positions, we have a total of eight decisions to make. Since the first decision had 20 outcomes and each subsequent decision has one outcome fewer, then there are a total of 20 times 19 times 18 times 17 times 16 times 15 times 14 times 13 or 5,079,110,400 ways to arrange the cards. This computation is the permutation p of 20 comma 8. So this structure is what gives rise to the permutation formula. Our final special case of the multiplication rule for counting possibilities within combinatorial systems is known as a combination. One way to think of a combination is that it's very similar to a permutation. It counts the number of outcomes in systems where we're selecting some number of things from a larger group, just like permutations do. However, unlike what permutations count, combinations pay no attention to the number of ways that you might arrange that selection or assign the members of that selection to various roles. So the formal definition of a combination is that it's a selection of R objects from a collection of N objects in which the order of selection is irrelevant. Notationally, we represent combinations a few different ways. C of n comma r is one way of representing a combination. But this, this notation that almost looks like a fraction, n over r, is stated n choose r, and it's known as a binomial coefficient. So 
those two pieces of notation refer to the same thing. And the way that we compute a combination is to simply compute the corresponding permutation and divide it by the factorial of the number of things that we're selecting R from the group. Just like we um, will see with factorials and permutations, a combination is a mathematical operation that can typically be computed using a scientific calculator, uh, you know, a function on a scientific calculator or within a mathematical software package such, such as MATLAB. We'll try to uncover the origin of the combination formula with an example. So we're still interested in determining how many ways we can select eight cards from our collection of 20. But this time we're going to say that the order of selection is no longer important to us because we intend to package the cards in a box and send them to a friend as a gift. So it should be clear that the number of permutations of eight cards selected from 20 or P of 20 comma eight is too big. This is because two selections involving the same cards that were retrieved in different orders would be treated as different selections, and in this scenario, that's not necessary. Since order is no longer important to us, these two selections should not be treated as different. Therefore, for any set of eight cards that we choose from a collection of 20, we would need to determine the number of ways this set of eight cards could be rearranged. This would be the factor by which we're overcounting our possibilities if we tried to count them with a permutation. And we already know how to compute this overcounting factor. It's just eight factorial, or the number of ways that we can take eight things and scramble them, rearrange them across eight different roles. Therefore, the total number of ways we can simply select eight cards from 20 is what we would obtain from a permutation, p of 20 comma 8, divided by 8 factorial. And this results in the combination, or 125,970 ways to make our selection. Later we'll see that just as was the case with factorials and permutations, there's typically a menu function or a button on most scientific calculators that allow us to quickly and efficiently compute combinations. And the same is true with various mathematical software packages. Combinations have their use in our ongoing example on rabbits and tularemia as well. Earlier, we introduced data that we had obtained by sampling 30 rabbits each from 40 different populations and then administering tests to each of them for the presence of tularemia. The resulting data set looked like this list of numbers, and it represented the numbers of, infec of infected rabbits that we found in each of the samples. If at this point we had known the total numbers of rabbits in each of the populations and the total number of infected rabbits in each of the populations, then we'd be in a position to determine the probability of each data point in that set. To see what I mean by that, we could imagine answering the following question. What's the probability of obtaining a sample of rabbits with 10 that are infected, or, or 5, or 7? These are just the first three values in our data set. Of course, at this point, we know neither the total size of any of the populations nor the total number of infected rabbits within any of the populations. And so we'll have to wait until we develop parameter estimation techniques before we can actually determine those quantities. However, for now, we can just make a wild guess. We'll assume that there are 1,500 rabbits in each population that we've sampled from and 400 of them are infected. We'll represent those parameters with the capital letters N and K, res respectively. So first, we'll determine the probability that a sample of 30 rabbits will contain 10 that are infected. Well, first, we must count the number of ways that we can sample 30 rabbits from a group of 15 without restriction. We compute this directly with a combination, and there are N equals C of 1,500, 30 ways to do this. 
Next, we'll need to determine the number of ways that we can observe our preferred outcome of obtaining a sample with 10 infected and 20 healthy rabbits in it. This is a two-step decision process, and the first decision involves determining which 10 of the 400 infected rabbits will end up in our sample. So there are C400, 10 ways that we can make this decision. We compute it with a combination. The second decision involves determining which 20 of the 1,100 healthy rabbits will end up in our sample. So there's a C of 1,100, 20 ways to make this decision. So by the multiplication rule, we just multiply these two numbers together in order to determine the total number of ways that we can make this special selection of, uh, of 30 rabbits, of which 10 are infected. So we know our preferred number of outcomes and our total number of outcomes, and then we can use classical probability to determine the probability of obtaining a sample of size 30 that contains exactly 10 infected rabbits. And this probability is just C of 400 comma 10 times C of 1100 comma 20 over C of 1500 comma 30, or just simply R over N. And if we were to perform these calculations with a calculator or mathematical software, we'd see that this prob probability results in about 11% or 0 0.1106. Well, we can follow the same pattern of reasoning to compute the probabilities of other data points in our data set. For instance, we can compute the probability of obtaining a sample of size 30 that contains exactly five infected rabbits. And it turns out to be about 8% or 0 0.08180. We can even determine the probability of obtaining a sample of size 30 that contains no more than five infected rabbits. We're just going to have to work for it a little bit more because we're asking about the probability of any of the outcomes of observing 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5 infected rabbits in a sample of size 30. So we just compute the probabilities of these individual outcomes separately and then add them together. And after doing that work, this results in a probability of about 14.75%. And this comes from computing the probability that the sample has no infected rabbits, and the probability that the sample has one infected rabbit, and then the probability that the sample has two infected rabbits, all the way up through the probability that the sample has five infected rabbits, and add them together. Most of the time, we'll need more than just one of our counting rules to successfully compute a classical probability. We'll need to use several of them together in concert, and the following example illustrates how this can be done. A group of candidates have applied for employment at a large social networking corporation. As a part of the selection process, candidates will be placed into teams of 12 people who will all be assigned different roles in which they work together to solve a complex software engineering problem. Of the 287 candidates, 126 have completed a computer science degree, 83 attended a software engineering boot camp, and the remaining candidates learned their software engineering skills through self-study. Assume the selection committee forms the first team of 12 by randomly selecting them from the pool and assigning them to the roles within the team. We seek to determine the probabilities of the following events. All 12 candidates on the team learned software engineering by self-study. There's a total of 287 candidates and 12 being assigned to the roles on the team. Therefore, there are P 287, 12 ways to form the team without any special restrictions. This is a permutation. On the other hand, if the team will only consist of candidates who learned software engineering through self-study, then there are a total of R equals P of 78, 12 ways to form such a team. This is because there are only 78 candidates who learned through self-study. So this number of preferred outcomes is also a permutation. 
Therefore, the classical probability of forming this team is just p equals r over n, or the number of preferred outcomes divided by the total number of outcomes using the two permutations we've just calculated. And this results in a very small probability of 8.4 times 10 to the negative 8. In this case, permutations were the best tool for counting both the total number of possibilities and the preferred number of possibilities of this event. Well, now we'll move on to computing the probability that the first six roles are filled by candidates with a computer science degree, and the remaining six roles are filled by candidates who have attended a software engineering boot camp. Well, we already know the total number of possibilities for this selection, but we still need to compute the preferred number of possibilities. To do so, we've got to view the formation of that committee as a sequence of two decisions. There are p of 126, comma, six ways to assign computer science graduates to the first six roles, and p of 83, comma, six ways to assign the boot camp attendees to the last six roles. Therefore, by the multiplication rule, there are r equals p of 126 comma 6 times p of 83 comma 6 ways to form such a team. Once again, the classical probability of forming such a team is just p equals r over n, or the number of preferred outcomes that we've just computed using permutations divided by the total number of possibilities that we computed earlier also using permutations. And this probability still comes out to be quite small, 3.8958 times 10 to the negative 6. So in this case, the permutation was still fundamental, but we needed the multiplication rule in order to understand how to deal with the assignment of candidates who were drawn from two different categories. We move on to computing the probability of the event that half of the roles are filled by candidates with a computer science degree and the other half are filled by candidates who attended a software engineering boot camp. This is not the same as the previous example. It ends up being a sequence of three decisions. Our first decision is to select six computer science graduates without assigning them to roles yet. This is a combination and there are c of 126 comma 6 ways to do this. There are c of 83 comma 6 ways to select six boot camp attendees without assigning them to roles. Now that we have selected all 12 candidates for the team, we assign them to the 12 distinct roles on the team. There's 12 factorial ways to do this. Since we know the number of outcomes for each of the three decisions in our selection and assignment process, we can use the multiplication rule to count the ways we can form this team. There are r equals c of 126 comma 6 times c of 83 comma 6 times 12 factorial ways to do this. So the classical probability of forming such a team is just r over n, the number of preferred possibilities that we've just computed divided by the total number of possibilities that we computed earlier. And this comes out to about 3.6 times 10 to the negative 3, which is, a, again, a relatively small probability. Now, if you think carefully about the relationship between the combination and permutation formulas, our formula for this probability is going to simplify to this expression that only involves combinations. And that might seem odd because all of the permutations have dropped out, yet the process is still one that involves selection and assignment. Can you think of any good reasons for why this might have happened? Well, the final event for which we'll compute a probability is stated this way. The first six roles are filled by five candidates with a computer science degree and one who learned software engineering by self-study. The last six are filled by four candidates who attended software engineering boot camp and two candidates who learned software engineering by self-study. Well, we can think of this scenario as a sequence of many decisions. And the first of these decisions involves counting the number of ways that we can select five computer science candidates who will e eventually serve among the first six roles. There are 
C of 126 comma 5 ways of doing this, which we compute as a combination. Next, we select one candidate who learned through self-study to eventually serve among the first six roles. And there are C of 78 comma 1 ways to do this. We also compute this as a combination. Well, we've now selected six candidates to serve in the first six roles, so we've got to assign them to those roles. There are six factorial ways to do so. We move on to selecting candidates for the next group of six. We select four boot camp attendees who will eventually serve among the last six roles, and there are C of 83, 4 ways to select them. This is another combination. We'll select two candidates who learned through self-study to eventually serve among the last six roles. And there are C of 78, 2 ways to select them, yet another combination. Finally, there are six factorial ways to arrange this second set of six candidates among the last six roles. Well, now we know the number of outcomes for each of our six decisions in the selection and assignment process. We can use the multiplication rule to count the ways we can form this team. There are r equals c of 126 comma 5 times c of 78 comma 1 times 6 factorial times c of 83 comma 4 times c of 78 comma 2 times 6 factorial ways to do this. This counts the number of preferred possibilities in our scenario, and so we can use that to compute the classical probability of forming such a team. p equals r over n as usual. After computing this probability, we arrive at a value of 2.2 times 10 to the negative 4, which once again is somewhat small. In this example, hopefully it was apparent how important it is to model the processes we're analyzing as a sequence of decisions. We didn't limit ourselves to using only a factorial or just a combination or a permutation in order to count the number of preferred outcomes in any of the four scenarios we just studied. Instead, we used most, if not all, of those tools to count the number of preferred outcomes. And it was the multiplication rule that glued the results together into a comprehensive tally. It's the multiplication rule that models this structure of a sequence of decisions that we use to describe the processes that we're completing. So the moral of the story here is that you really have to use your head on these more complex uh, scenarios where we're counting possibilities. A good strategy is to begin by looking at these examples as a sequence of decisions and then for each decision maybe determine how am I going to model this perhaps as a combination or permutation or a factorial or maybe even something else. Well that brings us to the end of this video lesson on classical probability. So thanks for joining us, and we'll see you on the next video lesson.